Hi everyone, we're back at the Arthritis Broadcast Network booth here with Nadar Khalidi. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Would you mind sort of introducing yourself and explaining how you're involved in rheumatology? Thank you for having me. <clears throat> so I'm a rheumatologist in McMaster University at, uh, in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, and I have several different hats over there. So I started off as a clinician meaning that I treat patients, and then I got into the educational field and uh, started off by helping to train um, uh, postgraduate students for medical school. Uh, and they didn't have an interest in rheumatology, um, uh, but we tried to instill in them. And then to actually train rheumatologists, there's a, you have to go to the PGY4, the postgraduate year four to five. So I'm, I've been the program director there for quite a while. I think they're ready to push me out because <laughs> I've been there one of the longest uh, program directors. But we've had a lot of success there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think one of your other questions was how did I arrive to be doing, uh, yeah. to being a rheumatologist? Well, uh, I'm what they call a bit of a broken arrow. So I trained uh, many years ago, nine, I think I graduated in 1980s, 1990 from medical school. And um, uh, I didn't actually quite know what I wanted to do. I had some interest in rheumatology at the time in medical school. I had some mentors there. Uh, but I went and did general practice. And so at that time, you could do one year of training and go into practice. So I did that. And then ultimately, um, I, I, I went uh, back to school. So I trained in Chicago. Um, I found it tough to get back into a school in Canada after training. There were some limitations, so I ended up in Chicago. And I did five years, uh, the five years of postgraduate training, and then decided I still wanted to come back to Canada, so they welcomed me finally in Hamilton <laughs> as well. So, um, so I started off as a clinician and then moved along to, to what I'm doing now. The other thing that I've, as the years have gone by, I've decided to specialize in vasculitis. And um, there's a lot of new, exciting things that have come out in vasculitis. So I run a vasculitis clinic. I'm now part of a um, research group, a North American research group called the Vasculitis Clinical Research Consortium. And then <clears throat> locally now, or nationally now, um, have begun to develop a, a, a Canadian network called the CanVasc uh, group. And would you mind explaining what vasculitis is? So in general, vasculitis is a disorder of inflammation of blood vessels, so, which is rather a broad term, but every organ requires a blood supply and uh, um, to deliver oxygen, so the blood vessels become inflamed. So just the way joints do, um, uh, these blood vessels become inflamed. And because the blood vessels become inflamed, there can be a whole wide variety of symptoms, so not just in the joints, so it's, it's kind of odd that a rheumatologist is looking at the whole, you know, um, something more than just the joints. Mm -hmm. um, and the principal problem is not in the joints. So some patients with vasculitis can have some joint symptoms, but the majority of them will have a part, one particular organ or multiple different organs. So okay. and it's and the, it's a rare disease. Mm -hmm. So it, the, because it's rare, it can be missed. And so people can go with mis these misdiagnoses for years and uh, some months and then sometimes years. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to sort of, um, is there any markers of it, I guess, as a person to recognize that you might have this? So there are probably over 14 or 15 different types of vasculitis. So each one so um, may have a marker, but, um, uh, and we're now, the, principal way to have diagnosed it many years ago is by biopsy, meaning that you have to go in, take a piece of the tissue out, and look at it under the microscope. Uh, now, uh, in, in many of the, our disorders, about 70% of people can be um, diagnosed by what we call surrogate biomarkers. So for instance, in the ANCA vasculitis, there's an ANCA blood test. If you have that ANCA blood test with a series of uh, of symptoms, then you can be called ANCA vasculitis. Um, I'm talking, I do a lot in large vessel vasculitis, and in large vessel vasculitis, there's actually no blood test that can confirm it. Um, so there's a variety of ways of doing that. So the one is, the one simple biomarker is a SED rate or CRP, which we use also in, in arthritis. 
So in the vast majority of patients with vasculitis, um, uh, M-elevated SED rate will be there. So, um, or CRP, those, are, those mm -hmm. are things that we would look at for that. But for the large vessel, giant cell arteritis, and uh, the lesser, um, uh, the more rare tachyasus, imaging uh, would be very important too. So looking at um, CAT scans, MRIs, mm -hmm. um, and the like as well too. Okay, interesting. Um, so today you had a presentation, and tomorrow um, you're running a workshop, I believe. Yes. So can you tell us a bit about that? So um, the topic today um, um, has been on a uh, disorder called giant cell arteritis. Giant cell arteritis is a disorder in patients over the age of 50. Uh, so the conference that we're at uh, is about precision and personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. So for years, giant cell arteritis um, so the precision part of it, or the person is, that you have to be over 50. If you're under 50, um, then you may be called tachyasus arteritis. But um, a new agent has come out uh, that, um, yeah, for years, the only drug that worked was prednisone. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine that in older patients being on prednisone for two, three years, yeah. and all the all the issues that arise with prednisone, so. Other drugs have been tried, so methotrexate, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, but they, they haven't had this um, uh, great success. So maybe 25% of patients might respond to methotrexate. You might not put everybody on it right away. Um, so the new drug that's come out is a drug that's been used for years in, rheumato in uh, rheumatoid arthritis, tocilizumab. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the trade name is Actemra. So a trial uh, was um, uh, started three, four years ago by, by industry. Um, and it's great that industry is now looking at rare diseases because without, you know, without, uh, without that support, these are expensive drugs yeah, um, that, yeah. that, are, uh, that may not ever come, come about uh, in, a, in a very uh, um, uh, unbiased uh, way to, to look at it. So it was an open label, it was a, um, a double-blinded uh, placebo-controlled trial where nobody knew whether they're on prednisone or, or mm -hmm. this tocilizumab. And in the end, the results had shown that if you were on prednisone and prednisone alone, at the end of a year, only 20% of patients who were on prednisone were in remission, meaning that they didn't have a flare, they still had. But in the tocilizumab, it was a, an amazing, uh, f about f a little over 50 to 60 percent, 56 percent of patients were in remission at one year, meaning that they came off all of their prednisone completely at the end of a year. Wow. So, you that's, know, the, yeah. so the question now is what's the role of this expensive drug? Mm -hmm. uh, it's been approved now in Canada as of October. Um, it was approved earlier in the United States for treatment of giant cell arteritis. So we'll have to see where the which payers, which provincial payers, and most of the patients are older than 50, um, and you know, so the provincial government still hasn't looked into uh, to covering it. So, but definitely the patients who have premorbid conditions, diabetes, osteoporosis, glaucoma, cataracts, which I would think is about 80% of our older yeah. population have it, that this is sort of a, um, uh, uh, now a relief to go off of, I mean, you're, you're still going on a drug, mm -hmm. but you're going on a drug with far less side effects yeah. in the long run. And would you mind explaining maybe for some viewers who aren't aware of um, some of the side effects of prednisone and what it can do long term, could you explain that? Sure. So in the, in the short run, um, some patients might love it. So I, I explain to patients that prednisone is like fire. You know, if you <laughs> use it properly, you'll warm up. <laughs> if you don't use it, you'll get burned. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, uh, you know, particularly in the older patients, the biggest is osteoporosis and fractures. So they'll come in back fractures, uh, you know, falling, uh, high mortality rate with, with that. Um, um, uh, the cataracts and glaucoma um, are, you know, almost everybody will get an accelerated cataract on it. So that's easier to deal with. Um, you still have to undergo an operation, but glaucoma, you know, um, you know potentially losing vision. Mm -hmm. um, infections are big, right? So in older uh, patient population, if you get a pneumonia that, um, you know, you, get, you might get admitted to hospital on antibiotics. Um, so, um, so for tocilizumab, the infection risk might still be there. 
but uh, definitely cataracts, glaucoma, diabetes, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, fractures, those are all gone. So you go from you know, almost a 25, 30% risk with steroids down to less than 5% in the long run. Mm -hmm. That's great. As, as a patient, I know that um, I, I wouldn't want prednisone to be my only option of something to be on to help my disease. So that's great. Um, and I know we've spoken about it a bit, but is there anything else you wanted to say about um, the theme of this conference, precision and personalized medicine, how it relates to what you're doing? So one, a big part of what I've done and I've published in is imaging and helping diagnose giant cell arteritis. So up until now, the only thing that you could do is to do a biopsy. So you could suspect it, um, uh, so you would send people for a temporal artery biopsy. So now uh, you can do ultrasounds, so that's emerged, uh, and our hospital uh, has really looked at MRI, an MRI not for the large vessels, which can be involved, so it's a little complicated, but uh, of, of the temporal artery. So you could um, come to see us, and instead of me saying, okay, you're going to undergo this operation, which is not a big operation, it's a 15-minute operation and having a scar, but instead of having that, I can send you for an ultrasound, and uh, it, depending on your risk, so this precision and personalized meaning mm -hmm. that we decide what your risk is, if you have a low to moderate risk that we may or may not have it, do the ultrasound if it was positive, then you don't need to go for the biopsy. If mm -hmm. it's negative, then you can undergo an MRI. And the MRI is the flip side that if, it, if it's negative, it highly predicts having a negative biopsy. So then if you do the MRI and it's negative, then you wouldn't have to undergo the biopsy. You could still have giant cell, but it might be a, a, a better form of giant cell that you wouldn't need as intense steroid therapy as well. So that's, so that's the um, precision part of personalizing is deciding which of these tests we need uh, to mm -hmm. have done. Okay. Um, Anita, is there any questions from our viewers? Do you think there will be more treatment options in the near future for a giant cell arteritis? I, in the, it depends what you mean by the near future. So the near future in the next six months, no. But in the next couple of years, absolutely. So uh, there are other companies that have, uh, so I already participated in another trial with another drug in, a lot of these drugs are from rheumatoid arthritis in Abitacept. So we've published on, uh, on abatacept in it. it was a smaller trial. A uh, bigger trial was initiated but was, was withdrawn or was, was held. So there's a promising agent. Um, there are uh, other drugs that are out there. Uh, Ustekinumab, which is used for psoriatic arthritis, is being looked at for GCA. Um, uh, Baricitinib is being looked at for GCA. Uh, which is um, a drug that's not come to Canada. Tofacinib is out in Canada. These are the JAK inhibitors, and they're highly successful in rheumatoid. And finally, other companies who are making IL-6 drugs, which is Actemra, Actemra is IL-6, that are making those drugs are looking to, to, at the success of, of tocilizumab to, to being used. So we have five or six agents that would never have been looked at um, you know, 10, 20 years ago, um, they're all expensive, just the way they are, but, um, but then you can help decide who, um, who might get what. And finally, do women get uh, giant cell GCA uh, more than men? So the literature suggests that it's supposed to be more female. I think it's 70% versus 30%. Uh, we don't know why that is. Um, um, but I don't think that there is a gender difference in terms of severity of the disease um, yet. So um, it really depends on if you are biopsy positive. So there's, if you're biopsy positive, but you can also have a large vessel version without any cranial symptoms, meaning that, that it's purely in the large vessels. And that's harder to diagnose. It takes longer to diagnose. On average, for the people who have headaches or cranial symptoms, i.e. cranial means head, um, uh, you can diagnose that one to two months, but the large vessel can be five, six months delayed because your symptoms are um, feeling unwell, weight loss, yet your arm might hurt as you move it and people might mistake it for shoulder pain rather than, rather than a blood flow problem until somebody decides to take your blood pressure, they go, oh, you've got a blood pressure problem, and then doing the physical exam. So. Um, 
there's, I don't think there's um, uh, 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 um, a gender difference in those different types of presentations, but certainly females get it more than men. Okay, well, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. You have contributed so much to the field of rheumatology through research and teaching and your own uh, for being a pediatrician. So thank you very much. So just, I'm an adult uh, physician, uh, adult, adult rheumatologist. <laughs> adult rheumatologist. Well, I was doing so many <laughs> few interviews today. Thank you. Thanks very much.